Hi, I'm Ranger Mara in the Big Meadow at Shenandoah National Park. At this time of year, after the leaves have fallen from the trees and the fall color has faded, animals like reptiles and amphibians and insects have found secure places under things where they can keep themselves from freezing over the winter. It's a different world. It's a quieter world. And you might think there's not a lot happening. There is a reduction in animal activity. Plants, of course, have slowed down. Everyone's waiting for the springtime when they can burst forth in bloom again and, and awaken. There are some animals that are still active right now, and we'll talk about those in just a little bit. But uh, right now, I'd like to focus on what you can see on a um, gentle stroll in a meadow or just a short hike down a trail at this time of year. There's a lot of evidence around you to tell you what's been going on all winter. And we can start by looking down. This leaf can tell a story. I wonder if you know what might have made the holes in this oak leaf. They're perfectly round. You might think a caterpillar, perhaps. Now, generally, when a caterpillar feeds on a leaf, it's going to make a hole like this one. Not very round. It's going to be chewing in a, a, a random pattern. But these holes are nice and round, and those are made by insect galls, uh, G-A-L-L. -L. The, there are several types of insects that make galls on plants, but they're very small. They can be little tiny wasp, uh, a little tiny fly, or a midge, very small insect. And what they do is they will lay an egg on a leaf, on a stem, whatever their favorite plant is, and that egg then will uh, cause a chemical reaction in the plant. The plant will try to reject that invasive egg and it will cover it up with plant material. And it forms a gall, it could be round, uh, it could be oblong. There are different shapes that respond to these different chemicals. And oak trees are pretty, um, mm, I should say they're, they're pretty popular among gall insects. And you can see this one certainly uh, was a favorite. <laughs> so many galls uh, eggs were laid on this leaf. What happens then is that that egg will hatch and a little wiggler, a little tiny wiggly uh, uh, insect will come out and it will immediately begin to eat that vegetable material that the plant provided that covered it up. This particular gall, I've seen them on here earlier in the season, and they're small and round, about mm, as big as a blueberry, <laughs> and they're kind of fuzzy like a peach. And that is the perfect food for that gall insect baby, <laughs> whichever it may be. And can you imagine what your favorite food is just for a second? And think about your being in a room that's made up of your favorite food. Uh, let's say strawberry ice cream. Okay, you're in a room full of strawberry ice cream and the only way out of that room is to eat your way out. That's exactly what happens with these little gall insects. So they're eating, eating, eating that vegetable, vegetable material, which by the way is helping to keep it protected from the weather, from the cold temperatures, um, and from being eaten by something like a bird that might not see it on the underside of the leaf. It can hide. So it's eating, eating, eating all the strawberry ice cream that it wants. And when it's had its fill and it's grown and grown, it will become an adult insect with wings and be able to fly away. But how is it going to do that if there's no doors or no windows in that room, which there aren't? It's just a room, no doors, no windows. That little wiggly insect has to know that it has to chew an escape hole before it transforms into an adult with wings. So that's what it does. Choose a little hole out of the gall, goes back in, metamorphoses, transforms, and flies out as an adult. And there were quite a few of those happening on this leaf. 
So pick up a leaf, notice those perfectly round holes you might see, and imagine how many gall insects are out there. So this time of year we see a lot of dead leaves and grasses and they look kind of untidy and but that's just nature uh, getting ready to, to go to sleep for the winter and what happens is those dead leaves and dead grass blades are going to fall to the ground where fung fungus and bacteria will act on them and help to break them down that's that decomposition process that starts and as that happens these leaves and grasses will eventually be turned into nice humus soil down here. So it's nice and nice and rich and dark and brown. It's got a lot of organic material in it right there. And that's how nature renews itself. So this time of year, when the leaves fall off of the trees here in our eastern temperate forest and our hardwoods lose their leaves until spring, it's an important time for soil to be renewed. It's a time of renewal. Even though it seems like nothing's happening out here, our soil is being recharged with new life and all ready to go to help new seedlings in the springtime. Okay, we've just come across an interesting gall right here. This is uh, on a locust sapling, a locust tree, and it's this swollen part right here where the the twig is coming up and then suddenly it bulges out. And that's where a gall insect of some sort laid its egg and caused the, the sapling to put out some vegetable, <laughs> vegetative material to cover it up. And what you can also see on this one is that there's the escape hole right there. So one successful gall here on the locust sapling. This time of year, part of the plan for plants is to renew their, their lease on life so they can start over again in the spring. And how they do that is by dropping seeds. Now, the milkweed has a, a fun way of doing that where their seeds will grow in these big fat pods through September and October. And then in October, after it gets really cold, those pods turn brown and they split open, they crack open, and the wind gently tugs out the seeds, which are attached to little bits of fluff, which the plant uses to um, uh, help send them on their way with the help of the wind. And we'll see, if, we'll see how far this one goes. Whoa, right there. Okay, <laughs> but still pretty far from the parent plant, and that's the idea. If all of the seeds just dropped below the parent plant, then the leaves of the plant might shade it out in the springtime. So by letting your seeds go and sail on the wind as far as they can, they may have a chance of starting a new plant farther away. Milkweed is one of the plants that has a plan B for um, uh, success. And so if their seeds don't work, the plant can still propagate through underground uh, stems. And that's kind of a good, they can put up fly, um, plant stems that way next year. But each of those stems is just gonna be a part of the same plant. So the genetic makeup is gonna be the same, every one of those stems. Now, if something were to happen, a disease would come in and affect that plant in a bad way, the whole plant could die, all of those stems, because they're connected. <clears throat> they're all connected to the same plant. Cross-pollination allows a plant to be a little stronger and maybe resist some uh, plant diseases. So when a plant is pollinated, that's what happened here. The flowers bloom, attract the pollinator like a bee or a butterfly, comes and allows that plant to get pollinated with pollen from another different plant. Now you've got two, two, uh, <laughs> two different DNAs working together to form a new plant and that can make a stronger plant. So cross-pollination is always the preferred method uh, in nature, but if it doesn't work, plan B for success is to grow by underground stems. So milkweed has it made. Some other plants that uh, will disperse their seeds in a similar way also grow in the meadow. 
and I found some right around here. One is the goldenrod. These will have beautiful yellow flowers uh, in hmm, September, usually in October. And they will also have fluffy downy seeds, much smaller, but they're also going to be carried away on, a, on, on the wind. And there they go. Okay, so you get a chance to spread seeds far from the parent plant. Others, let's see who else we've got here that I found. A nice grass here. This is one of our grasses. I believe this is called a broom sedge. It's actually a grass, but not a sedge. But it will also have these fluffy um, parts attached to their seeds, and they can carry off and make more grasses farther away. And lastly, we found a thistle flower here that has gone to seed, and it also has downy fluff that their tiny little seeds are attached to. And I don't know if there's any in there. We can see, oh yes, there's little tiny seeds attached to this downy fluff. And that will carry them off just like the milkweed that we saw earlier. What's also neat about this and this milkweed fluff is that it's used by other living creatures out here. Especially this time of year, mice and meadow voles, those are rodents that are a lot like mice, but they have shorter tails and, and smaller ears. But they're both rodents and they are all over the place out here and they're active all winter. They will take this downy fluff and line their nests with it, make a nice, cozy, warm spot uh, to raise their, their babies. So um, these plants are important, not just the seeds, but the fluff that's attached to them is important to some of our animals here in the meadow as well. We've come across some nice fruits of the wild rose. These are called rose hips, and these are native flowers. They will be about, oh, about that big around and pink and only five petals, beautiful, rather low to the ground, um, but just a lovely plant, and that's more of a summer bloomer. But when those flowers are pollinated, when they go to seed, they make a rose hip, just like your garden roses will make right there. And those are going to be important foods for those animals that are active in the winter. The birds that are still here that haven't migrated, uh, birds like uh, um, juncos and uh, titmice, chickadees, things like that that are here all winter. Um, as well as those rodents we talked about, the mice and the voles, they're going to depend on low growing uh, fruit like that to help to get them through the winter as well. And you'll notice that these rose hips right here are growing in a bed of moss. And that tells us that we're at the, the central wetland part of the meadow that stays damp uh, a lot of the year. And this time of year, that water table is recharging from the rainfall and eventually the snow uh, that will melt here. And that's important. You can see that by the path behind us here that it's pretty, pretty wet and damp. And that tells us that um, some animals are going to be here that might uh, depend on that moist environment. And those include our frogs and toads. Here in the springtime, in this wetland, there will be what we call vernal pools, uh, ponds of water that just appear for the season. And then as the summer goes along and we don't get much rain, that water table goes back down and those pools dry up. But in the meantime, um, amphibians like um, spring peepers and wood frogs and American toads will lay their eggs in this part of the meadow on those wet spaces. And those eggs need time to grow into tadpoles. The tadpoles need time to grow into uh, adults that breathe air and can climb out of those pools. So as long as those pools uh, stay wet, those animals have a chance to grow to adulthood. So these, the central wetland part of the meadow is important for those uh, particular amphibians. So where do they go in the wintertime? What are they doing right now? Uh, frogs and toads will burrow under the mud to stay below the frost line so they can stay healthy through the winter and they basically sort of hibernate through the winter as well. And some frogs even have a sort of um, antifreeze in their system that keeps them from freezing, even if the temperature does catch them where it's below freezing. So they can partially freeze and still survive through the winter, unlike you and me. 
Another reason to visit a wetland area like this one in the middle of the big meadow is that because it stays kind of wet, there's mud and that mud can help us to know who's been out here visiting this part of the meadow. So we'll see some tracks like these right here and we're seeing a lot of deer tracks out here and they're going in all different directions. So it wasn't just one deer, you know, going somewhere. It was several deer going uh, lots of places. And that leads us to our next spot. And that's where we're going to find out a little bit more about how we can tell um, how deer have been active in an area. In addition to their tracks, they leave some other evidence behind. So let's take a look at that next. So the tracks that we just saw down in the middle of the meadow where it's wet were indicating that there's a lot of deer activity here. And the white-tailed deer, this is their time. This is the mating time for the white-tailed deer. So this is when um, the hormones are raging and the males are out there uh, looking for the females. So the bucks, uh, the ones with the antlers, uh, the males are out there uh, looking for, for does or females <clears throat> to mate with. And uh, the, the bucks have an interesting way of uh, settling disputes. And uh, they'll do that with their headgear or their, their antlers. Uh, antlers are made out of bone and they start growing in the springtime, uh, kind of uh, uh, edged on, egged on by the hormones that are um, increasing in the, the deer at that time of year. So they start to grow in April, and by the end of the summer, the, the buck's antlers are developed enough. They, they rub off the velvety uh, outer coating on their antlers, and they're ready to uh, uh, test each other to see who's the, the best in the, in the area. And uh, what they'll do is they'll put their antlers together. Now, sometimes uh, when you're just a young buck, you'll have a, a small set of antlers like this. And, a buck that's this small is going to just look at this guy and say, you know what, forget it. You know, you, you go right ahead. I'll catch you in a year or two and we'll, we'll, try, we'll try to fight it out. Now, another buck that would be of a similar size would, would see this fellow and say, okay, let's go. <laughs> we'll see who's the best here. Put their antlers together and they will shove each other around. They're not necessarily trying to stab each other with their antlers, but they're, they're going to put their heads together and shove and push. And then the strongest deer or the one with the most stamina, after all of that wrestling match, they'll try to get different holds and twist their neck and everything like that. And they'll keep trying to get a, a hold like that. And um, whoever wins, the other buck is going to get tired and he's gonna go away, and then the other deer will be able to mate with the does in that area. And then, um, either before or after the um, successful uh, jousting tournament that they just had, um, the bucks will mark their territory. And they'll do that with their antlers as well, as, as well as some um, other um, uh, ways. But um, they will find a tree, and they will just tear it up. They'll just mark it up. Deer have uh, scent glands in their heads, on their faces, and on their legs, other areas, where they can leave behind a scent mark. And so they're basically marking the tree to show other deer that this is my territory, or I was here, and leaving a scent behind as well. And uh, this cedar tree has been really shredded up by a buck, and all the way around, it marked its territory up here. Deer um, often will, will mark a tree that has an aroma and cedars have a nice scent when the bark is, is scratched um, um, or, or rubbed off. And other trees that you can often find buck rubs, we call them buck rubs, um, are uh, other aromatic trees like uh, uh, black birch trees and um, uh, balsam fir trees, very aromatic. So it's almost like they're, they're putting on their cologne and they're, they're going out and saying, hey, look at me. So uh, buck rubs, uh, an interesting part of the, uh, the scene for, for deer. And an interesting thing that you can see on a, a gentle walk in the meadow or on a, a woodland trail here in Shenandoah National Park at this time of year when everything is quieting down 
there's still some evidence of things that uh, are going on or have gone on throughout the season. So uh, I hope you'll come out and explore the park, the meadow, even in the times when there might not be a lot of color in the trees or flowers blooming, there's still a lot to see in a reserve. See you next time. This is Ranger Mara at Shenandoah National Park. Hi, Ranger David here. Welcome to Shenandoah National Park. Guess what? Winter is here. It's gotten cold, the days are gotten shorter, the leaves have fallen off the deciduous trees, the flowers are all gone. So that's all indicators to not only us but to the wildlife that it's time to do something to get ready for the harsh, brutal winters that happen up here in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Now I just called the winters up here brutal. What do you think it is? that makes these winters so brutal up here? Well, let's explore. First of all, the temperatures. On average, the temperatures during the winter here at Shenandoah National Park are 35 degrees or so cooler in the winter than they are in the summer. That means if the average daytime temperature in the middle of the summer is 75 degrees, in the winter time, that's gonna to drop to 40 degrees for the high. And imagine a 55 degree low temperature at night dropping down to 20 degrees at night. Uh, so that temperature change makes a big difference. Another thing that makes the winters harsh up here is 37 inches of snow on average here in Shenandoah National Park. So we get a lot of snow here up in the mountains. Um, some years heavier, some years not so heavy. But that makes a big difference. And when you've got snow on the ground and on the roads in the park like it gets to be and long periods of cold, that turns into a lot of ice. So we get a lot of ice up here on the mountain during the winter time as well. So you combine these lower temperatures, um, potentially high winds, along with uh, the, the shorter days and the ice that comes up here, it makes it a hard place for you to live particularly if you're one of the animals here in the park. So what do the animals do? How do they survive this winter? What strategies do they use to make it through this harsh period of time? Let's think about some of them and see if we can explore a few. So one class of animals or group of animals that has a particularly hard time during the winter is the amphibians. Animals such as the Shenandoah salamander or the American toad that live here in Shenandoah National Park um, really cannot, uh, as amphibians, regulate their own body temperature, so they have to find a different extreme strategy on how to survive the coldness of winter. So what they typically do is bury themselves either into the ground or under the leaf litter until they get below frost line because they can't freeze or they can't come back from that. Uh, so they have to find that place underneath the ground and underneath somewhere that's below frost line. So for example, the American toad will dig a little tunnel down into the mud or into the, into the soft earth uh, and back up into that tunnel, uh, deep enough into the ground that he won't freeze, and that's where he sits and stays and lives off his fat during the winter. A salamander does a similar thing, but it's typically underneath leaf litter and underneath rocks where it can get protected from cold weather. So. The salamanders use that, let's dig in and find a place to stay for the winter and, and make it through this cold time till it warms back up. They typically start doing that in October here in Shenandoah National Park and they won't emerge until probably perhaps around April. So they spend a long time hunkered down in, the, in those places. Some of the frogs in particular can even do that underwater in the bottom of a pond. How do they do that? Well, amphibians uh, are different in that they don't have to breathe in order to get oxygen. They can absorb oxygen through their skin. So even if they're underwater in a wet environment, they can survive for a long period of time because they can absorb that oxygen and release carbon dioxide through their skin, which is not what we as humans can do. So that's how 
they make it through the winter, the amphibians do. So uh, how do the, some of the other animals, let's think about something else. Maybe the birds, what do the birds do during the winter time? For example, the red-tailed hawk. Well, they've got kind of a dual strategy to survive winter for them. Uh, some of them are year-round residents, and they stay here throughout the year, as do many bird species. So they, uh, they'll keep their nests, they'll find a place where they can hunker down, they hunt for the animals that might still be out, and they stay here all winter. However, there's also the migrating population, which what they do is they head south for the winter. They don't like the cold weather, they'll head to the south. So some red-tailed hawks migrate south, some red-tailed hawks stay here as year-round residents. And that's the same way with many of the other bird species here in Shenandoah. They do that. How do they stay warm if they stay here when it's really cold? Well, that's kind of a three-phase strategy that I call um, shiver, fluff, and cuddle. So birds do shiver just like we do when we get cold and we shiver. That is our body warming itself up by extra energy being expended to warm ourselves up. Well, birds will do the same thing, some of them will, and that's how they stay warm. They fluff up their feathers. They have all those feathers with down and etc. on them. So uh, just like your, your fluffy, your puffy jacket that you wear in the winter time, they fluff up their feathers and that provides warm air space inside next to their body that's protected by those feathers. And then the third thing is cuddling. Uh, if you go down along the road and you see a bunch of birds sitting on the telephone wire and they're right next to each other in the winter time, they're sharing body heat by cuddling close together. So that's a strategy that the birds use in order to survive through the winter is, uh, is to stay put or to fly south and then to, to cuddle and shiver and fluff during the winter. So while you may see birds flying around here at Shenandoah during the winter time, you're not likely to see any toads or salamanders out there anywhere. What is the one animal that most people who come to Shenandoah National Park really hope to get to see, our iconic animal? That's the American black bear. So what does a black bear do? How does it survive and where does it go during the winter time? Well, they have a different way of doing things. Their, their body systems don't slow down as much as some animals do. Their respirations slow down, their breathing, their, their heartbeats slow down, but their body temperature drops very little, only a few degrees, which means that they're, during their winter time, when they're, when they're sleeping, I call it sleepy time, it's, it's, uh, they can be aroused very quickly because of that high body temperature that they have. So while they're in kind of a stupor sort of state, uh, they're denning up in different places in the park in hollow trees is a favorite of theirs, underneath rock overhangs, um, and sometimes underneath a, a log that's laying on the ground or a hollow log inside of one. And if they can't find anywhere else, they've been known also to just dig a little depression in the soil and lay in that depression and curl up covering their nose because that's their most exposed area of their body and sleep during the winter. So while they're in that sleepy time, as I call it, uh, they can be aroused fairly quickly, but they don't usually. And they'll do that for perhaps three months or so here in Shenandoah National Park. So they're, they're out of the picture for a while. During that period of time, an amazing thing happens. Babies are born to the moms. And moms hardly even notice it, they're sleeping. And the babies are so small when they're born that it hardly even bothers the mom when the babies are born. And they typically won't even help their babies find their way to, nur to nurse. Uh, how do they do that? The hair on the body, on the bottom of the mother, on her belly is um, not as thick as it is elsewhere on her body. So there's more heat radiating out from that belly. So that's how the babies find where to go nurse is by following the heat from their mom. And so they'll stay there in the nest or in the den, wherever that happens to be with mom, until spring comes and they come out for the, for the spring. Uh, so that's what bears do. They also, as do many other mammals, uh, put on some extra fur during that period of time that helps them to make it through the winter by having a heavier coat of fur. 
So that's how a black bear makes it through the winter and what they do while they're here in Shenandoah National Park over the winter time. So you're not going to see those very often either. So those are strategies. We've looked at and talked about amphibians, we've talked about birds, we've talked about mammals in the black bear in particular. Uh, there's one other group of uh, inhabitants here in Shenandoah that I know you're really interested in. How do they survive the winter? And that is the park ranger. Park rangers use all of these strategies to survive the winter. We have the ones that do similar to the birds. Some of them migrate to warmer climates during the winter. They'll take winter seasonal jobs at places like the Everglades or Death Valley or Joshua Tree, and they spend the, their winters in those warmer climates and then they'll return back here to Shenandoah next summer for a summer seasonal job here. Some of the rangers stay year round. And while they might be up here at the top of the mountain, if the weather permits, oftentimes they're like a toad or a salamander. They're kind of squirreled away down in the bottom at headquarters, staying as warm as they can, trying to make it through those colder, uh, more brutal periods up here on top of the mountain. And then there's that other strategy that, that park rangers use. They hibernate. Some of them, when they end their seasonal job, will head back to mom and dad's house or a friend's house or somewhere else and that's where they'll spend the winter waiting for that phone call that hey next spring we want you back up here on the mountain. Now the animals that we talked about usually hot, uh, fatten up in the fall prior to their hibernation. We call that hyperplasia. Rangers on the other hand do just the opposite. They're in their best most fit condition when they finish their six months of working out here and hiking trails and leading programs and then they go home and they fatten up while they're sitting at home at mom and dad's house waiting for the next call. So that's how the rangers survive the winter here in Shenandoah. <laughs> and uh, if you see one, say hi. And so when you do come to visit, just be aware that you're not gonna see as much wildlife as you will other times. You might still see a deer or some squirrels or some birds while you're here, but you're not gonna see as many people and you'll enjoy your visit. So thanks for listening today and I'll see you at the park.